So, hey, welcome, uh, welcome back to the uh, the Aerospace Executive Podcast. I am uh, I'm really happy to have three uh, really dynamic executives with me, all of them senior leaders at Clay Lacey Aviation. I've got Chris Hand, Senior Vice President of Northeast Development, Scott Cutshaw, the uh, SVP of Sustainability Strategy and Sustainability, and Joe Barber, the SVP of Commercial Ops. And Joe, I think you were also uh, nominated uh, NBAA 40 Under 40 last year, correct? I, I was in um, in the inaugural class uh, a couple of years ago, so I was, I was grateful for that. So thanks right. for the call. So it was a couple, a couple, I knew it was in there somewhere, but uh, congratulations on all that. So uh, thank you. Hey, thanks, fellas, for coming on today. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to, really happy to have you. Grateful to be here. So yeah, hey, look, so, to your podcast for quite some time. So so, so Clay Lacey, Lacey Aviation, you know, legacy company, obviously, you know, Clay Lacey, the founder, you know, 50 year history. But over the last couple of years, you guys have had a monumental, I mean, just a, a, taking a monumental trajectory, 140, 150 airplanes now. Yeah, we're and, we're right at 168 airplanes across 30, 37 cities in the United States. And then new hangars at Van Nuys down at Orange County, Oxford, yeah, so Connecticut. Exactly. Lots of, lots of construction and development going on. Our headquarters is at Van Nuys. Uh, we expanded there back in 2015, adding additional six acres and more hangar space. And then our, our two newer locations, uh, we have a full service FBO at Orange County, John Wayne Airport in Southern California, and getting ready to redevelop that 14 acre site should kick off in the new year. And then we're about, I would say, 60% complete with a 16-acre development, $43 million in Waterbury, Oxford, Connecticut, that will serve as a full-service FBO and our Northeast Operations Center. And I know the F I know the OEMs are making it really easy on you guys as their, their airplanes continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the uh, the footprints get get larger and larger and larger too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Our Oxford development in Connecticut is three 40,000 square foot hangars, uh, 29 foot doors to accommodate, you know, the, the newer, bigger airplanes, the G700, Falcons 10X, the Global 7500. Uh, you really need that extra height in there to to get those big birds and and, allow, and service them. What's the big uh, what's the big driver now? Is it is it is it 91 management? Is it charter? Is it a little of both? What uh, you know? What's what's driving y'all's y'all's business? Yeah, so you know, Craig, we're we're an asset management company, and um, you know, in in our time leading up to uh, present day, Clay Lacey, uh, we were other things, right? So we had experienced um, you know being an owner operator first, uh, and so that was driven largely on the focus of of charter and optimizing a fleet of airplanes. Uh, but that was a good learning curve for the company in its early origin. Um, you know, but as um, Brian purchased the company, uh, you know, from Clay, um, and now Brian's been with the company for over 36 years, but as he purchased it back in 2013, um, you know, that was a really uh, key transition. And as uh, Jim Collins in, in some of his books, right, <clears throat> this pivotal turning point for a company, that milestone in which um, uh, it redefined itself. And that was the asset management era. Um, and what's key to our services is that we have four business lines, aircraft management, charter, maintenance, and FBO. Uh, and where we can co-locate all those things, we serve our customers and employees the best. And so we're staying true to that model with our regional operations center approach. Do you see, I mean, you're 168 airplanes now. Is that kind of a critical mass where you where you start to see, you know, is that 169th, 170th airplane? Does it bring a lot to the business or do you, do you start to say, hey, look, we're, we're really good where we are. We could serve our customers or I mean, you've got some some companies out there that are you know, you know, a little bit larger. You've got some that are smaller. But, you know, how do you feel about the How do you feel about the size? Yeah, you know, from where we where we sit kind of in the. Uh, and the top echelon of asset and aircraft managers, you know, uh, there are some with with quite a bit more. And um, it really comes down to kind of what is the service that you're going to end up providing 
um, you know, we have reconfigured ourselves a number of times over the years to accommodate um, adjustments in the size of the fleet um, and our focus. Um, and we do. We we absolutely uh, look at ourselves on a routine basis to see how do we maintain the quality of service and the quality of employees that we need. And that does mean that we have to change um, our organization and our design. So um, I would say that there is definitely limits to certain uh, designs. Um, and, you know, you, you couldn't have taken what was Clay Lacey in the 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about culture on this call uh, and people. And, and that has a lot to do with the fact that it needed to change through its own era. Um, scale is an issue in this industry. Um, so dealing with it is, um, is, is the magic. Yeah, I, think, I think I think one of the one of the pieces too that comes into this is is growth rate management over the years um, is something that we've you know we've hit all all pegs on the meter with that right we've uh, you know you can possibly grow so slow that you're not relevant mm -hmm. um, but if you grow too fast um, you know your your customer service level drops down bandwidth becomes diminished and. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's critical. Um, and you, you talk about, you know, how do you go from 168 and, and then above that? One of the things that we've that's really surfaced as we've gone through this process, because we've tried every every, you know, every end of the spectrum um, is aligning ourselves with clients who who align with us. Right. So um, when you sit down at the table and they have expectations that 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 we culturally and uh, from a process standpoint align with, mm -hmm. um, that that's that usually results in a happy customer and one that we can service uh, to the best of our ability with all four business lines and um, uh, and, and whatever other business lines may uh, feel like is a, a relevant add to our core business, but. Um, uh, alignment of clients is something that uh, you know. I, I've been here, I guess, seven years, and and we've we've you know really found kind of a nice medium at this point. And and to your earlier question, you know, is it ninety one? Is it charter manages it? You know, it's a, it's a great mix of both um, in the portfolio because every all of those contribute to the whole. Um, uh, and, and at the end of the day, when we properly manage alignment with our clients. We also properly align a service experience that that re results in satisfaction, uh, both from then and and from from Clay Lacey, from uh, the the respect to our business. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting you 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 talk about alignment of the clients because that's the one you know, two things one growth at any cost has, <laughs> has killed more businesses than mm -hmm. uh, uh, than it's made, and then I always think about aircraft management. I always think about Lenny Dykstra. You know, everybody, the horror stories of Lenny Dykstra and his airplane and not paying bills and things of the sort. And I know a lot of management companies out there are like, hey, we'll take the client. It's all about the client. But then you got to realize that there's the client out there that doesn't have your best interest in line either, which serves nobody. So, yeah, the, ra the race to the bottom, you know, been there, yeah. done that. Um, uh, Brian and I <laughs> were talking <laughs> at the Christmas party last week at, or on Friday out here in Oxford, Connecticut, um, after he took a look at our the current state of our 120,000 square foot hangar that's that's going up at an extremely rapid rate, despite the uh, apocalyptic flooding that's going on today and then soon to be followed by 20 degrees of frost penetration on Wednesday. But um but, you know, we were talking and, and we, we were joking. I said, Brian, I said, I don't want to bring on any bad clients. He says, you and I Brian, brought on a lot of bad clients in our history. Mm -hmm. and, and those days are over and, and we're very happy to not do that. Um, and, and by the same token, you know, we we want, you know, those those great clients to to have an experience that we all agree upon right from the the inception of the deal. Right. Um, because th there's nothing worse than the three month in phone call of, you know, how, how does this cost this much, despite the fact that there's a budget laid out in front of you, you know, that kind of talks about the front loaded uh, nature of aircraft management, which which it most certainly is. And, and you know, those calls that used to come in on a, on a you know, I, I, almost like clockwork, you could see the meeting invite come out at the three month mark. Those calls aren't coming in anymore because uh, the, the communication that we give to these folks on the front end the, and the setting of expectations, the cultural alignment with the clients um, that we're committed to and and also the the continuous improvement of our company when when we see these issues come up anybody in the company can come forward and and, and flag an issue 
and it'll be managed by a team and, and, and a, a result will come out of that. And that result, ultimately, the goal of that is to to get um, client alignment at its at its peak, because that way our business runs efficiently and the clients are happy. And frankly, word of mouth, you know, uh, organic growth is kind of the name of the Clay Lacey game. Um, you know, we've done there's been some acquisitions, but ultimately organic growth is, is where we are and, and uh, kind of our credo. Um, and, and the only way to get that is to have folks that are, uh, that are, that are getting the satisfaction of, of the services that they expect from us. Yeah. And, and I'm going to take that. So two things we're going to do. So Brian Kirkdorfer brought, bought the company in 2013. And I remember there was a lot of private equity, just a lot of funds making a run at Clay when Clay would you know, kind of announced that he was ready to sell. Yeah, you know, a lot of private equity. Molus Capital was in, uh, a couple others, and ultimately Clay decided to, you know, sell it to a long-term employee who, quite frankly, has done a fantastic job with it. Yeah, how do you feel like, you know, Brian's involvement in the company has been? Yeah, you know, yeah, how how positive that has been, and then you know what you guys were talking about, which ultimately led to this conversation, was you know. You know, growing an aviation company the hardest way possible. You guys got five pillars you've kind of identified. So let's take Brian's involvement and and slide from there. Yeah, Craig, uh, thank you for that. So we're going to, we wanted to kind of unwrap that a bit. Um, you know, the ownership structure, I'm going to defer to Scott on that, but let me give some context to something that was actually just just a fun experience for all of us here and the, uh, the leadership team at Clay this year. Um, you know, so the, the whole idea of growing the business the hardest way was, uh, was kind of a slogan for learning from our mistakes and our missteps in our history. And, and that was, uh, that was something that, you know, we had had leadership longevity, uh, long enough to kind of, uh, teach us and, and pass that information down. So it wasn't, you know, recreating the wheel every time. Um, but what was important is that, you know, we, we always wanted to have, uh, this, this culture where we have, um, hired people and clients for the long term. We're looking at long term and how do you be long term in a business so volatile? And so that was a big question for us. And we always have interns and we had a couple of brilliant young interns this summer. And we sent them out on a course, uh, around the company to do pretty much every job over a period of time and take some notes. And we asked them as a capstone, hey, come back to us and let us know, what do you think the five, or not the five, but the, whatever the elements of, uh, of longevity and, and uh, of Clay Lacey for being around for 55 years? Uh, they came back about midway through and said, well, it wouldn't be very helpful if we only provided information we knew from the inside. Can we go look out at the industry and see what the patterns are? What, you know, what caused those other companies to last a long time or not? You know, and so, uh, yes, the answer was go for it, go do your research. And they did quite a bit. There's a lot you can find in industry headlines, Craig, as you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of what they came back with, there were five pillars. And let me just share what those are. And then we've each got a, a, a little point to share on each. Uh, so one, the proper ownership structure for the business. Uh, the second, the management of growth rate, which, again, Chris alluded to. Uh, three was diversification of business lines. Number four was the people. And number five was the culture. So all five, so ownership of the company, privately held, long-term employee, growth rate. I take it sustained, control. Organic. Organic. Organic, steady. Yeah. Um, Relevant and steady wins the race. <laughs> let's, Craig, you were asking about Brian's transition and ownership of the company. And so let, let's let's kind of talk about that in a structure format. So Brian had been with the company for roughly 20 years when he acquired the company from Clay. And there, there are a tremendous number of lessons. Brian shares a lot of antidotes within the company of things that he learned from Clay that's, that still guide the company today. And those are rooted in our values um, and we execute on those daily. 
But when it comes to the ownership structure, Brian's term, Brian is, is long-term. His view is long-term for the organization. So with ownership structure, it comes down to who, what, and when is how, how we like to talk about it. The who is the structure that the company has. In our case, we're privately owned. You know, Companies may be public, they may be private equity, other forms of structure. Depending on the who, the the what is what does that owner expect, and the when is the time frame under which they expect that return. So for us, we're a privately owned company. Brian expects steady growth at a at a consistent rate across our four business lines, and he's investing for the long haul. And that's why at the top of the program, you heard a lot about our investment in infrastructure and people throughout the organization, is we feel that over a longer period of time, that will deliver consistent growth and consistent stability and a better service for our customers and a better employment experience for all of our employees. So I'll give you an example of what we learned at one point in our history. We were approached about entering a new marketplace. And the caveat to entering the new marketplace was we had to enter into a partnership for this one location. The partnership was great. There was a misalignment on the on the what the expectations were and when the expectations were. And mm -hmm. ultimately, that misalignment of those two things led to dissolving of that partnership. And we we didn't enter into that into that geographic market. And so we learned from that. A, a positive example in our recent history of what you heard a lot about is Oxford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. It took us years to acquire the lease to the property. And now we're investing $43 million to build what is our Northeast Operations Center. That process from transitioning to Brian, acquiring the company in 2013, to acquiring our, our, our the company's acquire of Key Air, which is an aircraft manager charter company in the Northeast, to then acquiring the land and now building, that, that's been going on since 2013. It's been going on for 10 years. That's a long-term play with multiple pieces. And I think any other type of ownership structure might not be willing to be that patient and work through all those pro processes. But what it will result in is something that really serves our clients, serves the latest and greatest, largest aircraft that the manufacturers are producing, and has really helped our employees as well. Yeah, there's no way a private equity group is going to hang in there. For 10 year a fund which has to be in and out in five six years yeah. or wants to be in there yeah. five six years there's no way yeah. they're going to be able to make the investments that you guys have made yeah, yeah. the private the private ownership structure without a doubt gives you the ability to to drill deep deep meaningful roots which result in deep deep meaningful relationships with your clients and a commitment to your clients right and um and the ability to, to provide outstanding customer service to them uh, because it's a long haul uh push rather than a, 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 you know, a three to eight year gain. It's definitely, you know, like recently, you know, Volato just went IPO'd. And I think Fly Exclusive goes public today. Yeah. Um, you know, interesting. Volato wasn't even a company three years ago. And here it is, you know, comes out. I think it's got, you know, 30 jets, at a, 30 jets, couple on order, and all of a sudden it IPOs. And then Fly Exclusive wasn't a company three years ago either. And all of a sudden now they're, IPO and yeah, we we watch the headlines. We we see them, and and to be clear, we're not advocating that our ownership structure and our way of doing business is the best. Mm -hmm. What we are saying is that our ownership structure aligns with what we want to achieve over the time frame of what we want to achieve it. And so, a company that is owned under a different structure, they may look at a different time horizon and different um, success metric. Mm -hmm. So for us though, and this kind of leads into the next topic of diversification, right? Okay, right. now we know who owns us. We know this is a longer term play that we're building value over a long period of time. Um, so now how do we do it? And that's where diversification of our services has come in. And we've 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 learned a lot from that over the years that Chris can share more. Well, I think it's, you know, the the to go back to the the, the Kier example, that acquisition um, that that is a study in diversification, right? So uh, somebody asked me the other day, you know, what what is this out here in Oxford? And um, what it is, and 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 what it um, kind of launched out as was kind of a representation 
of uh, about you know th three of our four business lines um, in a in a bricks and mortar setting, which ultimately led to the long term investment of building this you know 120 thousand square foot hangar that that can pull in the industry's largest aircraft. Nobody else in the Northeast is building a hangar that that's specifically targeted to to um, and, and designed to to uh, accommodate the the global 7500 and the 700 and the 10x and and all these great new generation business jets. But you know, uh, in in doing so, what we've done is we we made we listened to our clients and our clients said, hey, we we want all your services, we want everything. And so we said, okay, we, we need to add fuel and FBO um, to our Northeast portfolio and, and our and our nationwide footprint. And so. Um, and, and, you know, we, we're out in Van Nuys, we're in Oxford, Connecticut, and we want to fill in everything in between where it's meaningful to our clients, um, and, and, uh, on a long haul plan to provide the best service, but diversifying the revenue sources for, for the company itself, um, allows us to give, uh, without a doubt the, the most, uh, steady service in, a, in an extremely volatile market that, that aviation is. I mean, we've seen a lot of highs and lows over the last, you know, five to 10 years, mm -hmm. um, whether it be charter, whether it be fuel pricing, whether it be aircraft uh, purchase pricing, um, the, the, the transaction rates that have occurred over the years. Um, but the beauty of, of the, 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 the four core business lines that we run is when one of them dips, inevitably, the one next to it picks up. The ultimate goal of that and, and, the, and the very best result of that is to have our clients not feel any of those vicissitudes in the market, right? Um, when, when, when one part of the business sags, we're able to buoy them up with the other parts of the business and make sure that their, um, their ownership and operational experience is, is, is unhindered by uh, market ups and downs. And so um, essentially, building this in the Northeast uh, in Oxford was was a commitment to uh, to stabilizing the customer and client service experience. And I, I I know I've I've been around other companies through the industry, and and there's a lot of ups and downs in in the the service that a client um, receives during uh, market shifts. And uh, something that's that's great about our culture that I'm I'm really proud of personally is that our client experience does not go up and down. It, it stays uh, relatively stable throughout all sorts of ups and downs over this. You know, we, we've been through some pretty interesting times in the last five years. Um, and to say the least, I think we're giving a better client experience and and with our self-improvement within the organization than we've ever been able to do. Um, and, and finally kind of figuring out who we are, who is Clay Lacey, what do we wanna be? We're getting pretty good at that. Um, and, and, and now rather than making large shifts left and right, um, we're able to really tweak and fine tune our product and, and give the clients what they're asking for um, on a very stabilized basis. What are your clients yeah. asking for specifically, do you think? Well, and so that was a that was a good point. Some of them will ask us to do something. And we've always had the entrepreneurial spirit to uh, to review and, and, and give a, an opportunity to see if we can explore and develop and, and create a business plan around a new concept. Um, and that's an important part to to the way that we look at development and the future of the company is we've always been an entrepreneurial company. We'll always evaluate things uh, before stepping into them. But I think, you know, a, a couple of good examples are that when we're asked to go do something, we'll, um, uh, we'll do the proper research to get in there. But we're not only taking that open source feedback from our customers, we're taking open source feedback from the industry and from our employees. So... Uh, for example, um, you know, it was uh, about 15 years ago, it made sense to start doing transactions. Uh, and I thought it was a good diversification of business line to buy and sell for our customers because they asked us to. Um, and so at the time, we developed that and it was it was a good business. But we went out into the industry and talked to individuals and asked for feedback and their feedback was fairly negative. They said, well, when you take in this space, in this swim lane, you uh, are not going to get returns from or reciprocity from us in the management business. Mm -hmm. And so as we heard that that was just this dynamic, this conflict that existed among multiple groups in the industry, we listened and we did the, you know, the cost benefit of that analysis and said, you know what, it, it really doesn't benefit us that much uh, for, for us to continue buying and selling airplanes. Um, we're going to we're going to divest of that. 
And that was an example of how diversification also requires some trimming um, because it is important for the health of the business that you find what your core competencies are and that you align your services with them as much as possible. We believe that these four are the ones that have been married and, and coexist the best together. Yeah, no, I looked, uh, you know, I know a lot of people, you know, they're trying to vertically integrate, you know, the acquisitions, you know, the the buying and selling of airplanes, trading of airplanes, but there's a lot of good, there's a lot of good brokers out there who do it, you know, much better than maybe y'all do. Focus on much better. You guys are great hanger. <laughs> you, you, you know how to manage airplanes, you know how to fly airplanes, you know how to hire fire pilots, you know how to do all the great stuff. Um, but, you know, I don't think the monetary rewards are so much that it makes a whole lot of sense other than, hey, we're we're keeping our customer happy, but there's better ways to keep the customer happy too. For the sake of a relationship, I'd much rather recommend an outstanding broker who's going to deliver a first class experience than try to muddle through it ourselves uh, for the purposes of some type of minor short term gain. Yep. No. And then, you know, and then you're making friends across the industry as well. So instead yes. of competing, instead of competing against the people who can recommend you as a management company, you're making friends. Exactly. So, you know, very, very valid point. So let's talk about the people side of the house. You guys have hired some industry superstars recently. And then uh, you've also hired some people out there that, you know, relatively unknown, but very talented also. So talk about how you're evaluating people and hiring them and you know, bringing them into the company and getting them ad adept to the culture. Well, the at the end of the day, the people are the company, right? And so really bringing in the right people that align with our cultural values that align with our strategic growth plan is important. Um, we've had some missteps in the past, you know, and I think a lot of companies have, have what, what I call hired for book. They hire somebody that can immediately bring in a lot of business and they've tended to, like we did overlook a values alignment. And ultimately that is not a recipe for long-term success. Mm -hmm. I think you're much better off hiring somebody for values fit and investing in them and letting them grow with the company and the longer term value that the, both the company receives and that employee receives is, is tremendous compared to the other way around. Mm -hmm. And so that that's been a big focus for us is if we if we are going to bring in somebody to the company, uh, is there is there a values fit and is there alignment with the type of growth? and the direction that the company is headed. Um, one of the things we've really uh, started investing more heavily into is, is scholarships and internships in the markets where we have brick and mortar locations, Southern California and, and the Northeast. Um, in, in the Northeast, we've partnered with CT Aerotech, which is a, a state run mm -hmm. uh, aircraft mechanic school with multiple locations. And we have a number of their graduates now working for our Part 145 MRO in Connecticut. And we have summer job shadow days and internships and, and growing people and investing people. They appreciate it. They want to work harder for the company. Um, and it, it contributes to that, that positive corporate culture of, of bringing in people that want to be there, that want to be part of what we're building uh, rather than, than, than not. Who do you find really works at Clay? Personality type, or you know, is it you know what's you know who's yeah, done so, well? Who's done well, and who hasn't? Not from a you know individual, but from a yeah. macro standpoint. Well, let's look at our three corporate values, and I think that'll answer that. Number one, strive for excellence. We kind of talk about that in our jargon every day. That's getting better every day. And Brian has a great example that he learned from Clay on that where. I can't do the story justice, but basically he did this long flight with Brian and they were hand flying a Learjet. And Brian says he's like, you know, 150 feet off for two and a half hours and he lands and he thinks he does a great job. And Clay goes, why were you 150 feet off the whole time for two and a half hours? You got to be dead on. And it, it really rooted in Brian's mind that don't accept anything less of, than perfection. So somebody that is okay being introspective and saying, you know what, I did pretty well at that, but I could do better next time. Or, hey, we have the system in place that's pretty good, but it can be better. So striving for excellence, better every day. The second one, thoughtfully better. 
That's our second value. How can we be better in a way that is meaningful to our clients or our employees? And then the third one, and I think this is the overarching value, and we talk about this all the time, is do the right thing. When we're looking to hire somebody, are they willing in the face of adversity, in the face of maybe losing a sale, in the face of of kind of eating some crow, are they willing to do the right thing? Because we firmly believe that if you do the right thing over a long period of time, you will achieve success. No one doubt. of the best quotes, one of the best quotes, I, I'll remember one of the first days that I met Brian, he said, Clay Lacey is a humble company that takes the correct turn at every fork that we do the right thing. And that, that to me, I know every day I walk in here, that's exactly, uh, that, that's what I operate. That, that, that's my credo when I walk in the front door. So is that what you stress all your new hires on? Hey, look, this is our culture. Strive for excellence. Um, thoughtfully better and, and and do the right thing. Is that absolutely if you're if you're doing those three things, you're gonna do just fine here? Yes, you will. And when we put systems in place to encourage those actions, we have a we installed Joe may correct me, I think it's been about four years now, a continuous improvement program. So it operates just like an SMS program. This is an aviation podcast, everybody knows SMS, right? But it operates in the same way. Anybody in the organization at, at any level can submit an opportunity for improvement or an area where we fell short of service. It gets evaluated by a cross-functional team across all of our departments. They mm -hmm. take proactive measures to improve that, and then they measure. And since the launch of this, we have close to 900 submissions in, in, this, in this system. And I think that's a perfect example of how we've put a system and a process in place that supports what we're asking our people to do from living in their values, right? If we want to strive for excellence and be every day, be better every day, if we want to be thoughtfully better, if we want to be able to do the right thing, then how do we enable our employees to do that? And our answer, one of our answers is the continuous improvement process. And it's a way to, to live that out on a day by day basis. And, and it's interesting we were talking before this, is there any one continuous improvement submission that kind of revolutionized the company? And, and we couldn't really come up with one. And what we came up with is it's a lot of little things that drive getting better over a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. It's very rarely one big thing. It's a lot of little things. And when everybody is contributing and they feel the permission that they can contribute to that and they see the company takes actions on their suggestions, then, then you really get that cross-functional buy-in. But that's but that's business. I mean, business is all about hitting singles. You know, you hit single, you swing for singles and doubles. You know, you'll hit some triples and you'll hit some home runs. Eventually, that's just the way it. You know, the but the the meat of the company is all on base hits. You know, doing the little things right. And you know, too many companies are out there. They want. I mean, I talk to them every day. They want the rainmaker. They want somebody who's going to come in in three days and transform your business. And transform their business. I'm like, yeah, it just it doesn't work that way. And, you know, Brian, Brian uh, had given a uh, he would done did a, uh, an interview um, over the summer, and he one of one of the statements that he made, which I think was in the video that we had at CJI, which I, I thought you know resonates with me, is he said you know almost a thousand people coming in every day striving for excellence. You you can't do anything but get better, right? And that's exactly. That's that's where we are today. That's that's the the current permutation of our culture, and and it took a long time to get here, but it's a really meaningful place to be, and one that is is very effectively. And that CIP program, I, I watch it daily, um, continually make our company better. And Craig, I mean, we, we've said it through some of the value statements. You know, the the, the CIP is <clears throat> is the evidence and back backbone to what we are doing to. Um, to show the action of, of continuous improvement. But like, you know, you talked about hiring and, you know, in, in terms of how our people exist and how they used to exist, I mean, it really was like a family <clears throat> and for all the right reasons, you know, a family <clears throat> existed to go through good and, and tough and, and tough times the same. Um, but at that company size, it, it may have been necessary then, but uh, to run a nationwide company and to, and to do one that is, uh, serving our customers, it absolutely must have uh, 
taken this pivot. So, you know, you can look back at that 2012, 2013 era and look at the leadership that was put in place. And you can look at the decision makers and the people with experience that that were asked to come uh, and be part of this uh, this next 50 years of the company. And so that really changed the entire culture from a family into a team. And the team required performance and everyone had to do their job and they had to do it well. And, um, and there's kind of, you know, you could always be accountable to somebody in the leadership team uh, and be expected to know that, you know, someone's going to come tap you when, when there's a need and it, perhaps if you're not doing that. And so I think that that's a new dynamic, that radical candor that comes out um, and a high performance team that um, that was necessary for, for us to move into this era uh, of continuous improvement. Yeah, but it's more than radical candor. I mean, you know, everybody, you know, you can read all the blogs and everybody's looking for good leadership. You know, I want leadership, leadership, leadership. Well, you know, good leadership is dependent on good follower, good followership. I mean, hey, look, if you're willing to, are, are you willing to, are you willing to follow? A good leader, but but it's also like you said, hey, we're all here for business, and and you come into work every day, and the expectation is you contribute, you know, a fair a, a fair day's work, and a fair day's performance for a fair day's pay. Um, so there's a lot of personal, uh, you know, there's a lot of you know, personal expectation on each on each employee to come in here and say, hey, look, you know, you know, you, the expectation is today you be the best you can today, and we'll all be fine. You know. It, it's so true. And and what it comes down to, and this is a leadership podcast, right? You have a lot of leaders listening to it, is the leaders need to live that. It's fine to have value statements. It's fine to have all these things and uh, systems. But if the if if the if the people if the employees do not see the leaders living out those values and saying yes or no to decisions based on those values then you see a, a, an eventual degrading of the organization over time because they they know that that's it's not real it's not listen if the, if the leader isn't going to do the right thing in this situation then why should i do the right thing in my situation and it permeates the company so no one's perfect we are not perfect we make mistakes all the time i think the important thing now is we have a system where we can identify those mistakes and work the system to slowly get better over time and not repeat those mistakes. But this comes down to the individual employee too. And it comes down to my, my opinion is, Hey, look, you know, every day is a chance to be a leader. You may not be a leader, but be a leader, come in, do <laughs> you know, do well, knock it out. You know, do the best you can knock it out of the park, do great things. Yeah. And then people will look to you as the, you know, the shining star or the, or the bright bulb to, to follow yeah. and, you know, leadership begets leadership, right? Yeah. But you, you know, you also, but, but also having a culture which welcomes the rise of, of people who choose to engage in leadership and choose to pick up the ball and take it to a next level. And, and I, I've never been involved in an organization that was so, um, encouraging of, of growth among employees. Like uh, we we we've had numerous examples just just in you know in the last seven to ten years, people um, you know people come to the table and and, and the the, uh, the the air of of the ability to rise here is so pungent that um, it, it feeds people um, to, to buoy themselves up to a higher level in the organization. And it, and it happens here very often. And we leaders, you know, we, we hire, we try to hire the best people and, and we're fortunate um, that, that we do hire the best people and, and we're able to, and, um, and be competitive in, in such a way that we're drawing the industry's best people. Those people come in and, and, and they, they actually uh, create enthusiasm among the ranks. And, and those people say, Hey, listen, I, I'd like to rise up to this level. I'd like to rise up here. I'd like to eventually be this this guy. I, I, that that is that is a very much alive and well here at Clay Lacey, and um, people rise here on a on a you know on a monthly basis to new positions that they probably never fathomed when they first started here at Clay that they would uh, be able to do. But but the uh, uh, the culture here is so um, incredibly strong in that direction that we're growing leaders all the time, um, and and those leaders. 
you know, part of a leader's job is, is to create followership, right? Mm-hmm. You you have to be a followable leader um, and, and create that enthusiasm in, in the folks below you and, 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 and lower in the organization. But those people all have the avenue to climb as high as they want to here at this company. Well, Brian's a very, I mean, I know Brian. I don't know him really well. But we've had you know, many conversations. He is probably the most confident, hands-off <clears throat> CEO. The, 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 you talk about the ultimate delegator. You know, he's a very confident <laughs> CEO. He's very confident. Hey, look, this is the direction we're going to take the company. But you got Dave Lamb as your CEO. And Dave's done a really good job of letting you guys do your thing. And, you know, there's no, you know, from what I've seen from the outside, not a lot of micromanagement, which does allow people to kind of, you know, rise to their rise to their abilities. Dave put put amazing structure in place to put the framework around the spirit of what this company was. Right, Brian set the spirit of what this should be, and Dave came in and 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 highly organizationally put the thing together so that it not you know so that the spirit can go like this. But there's but there's great structure around the spirit that keeps it t- channeled in the right direction and focused on core businesses. And, and that's those combination uh, of the, the charismatic leadership and the, and the structure are are bringing us great success as, as uh, all those pieces came together. But that takes a and, lot of courage from, a, from a CEO and a business owner to do that. Yeah. You know, most, you know, <laughs> most entrepreneurial business owners, they want to hold on, like they've got a death grip and they want to be involved in everything. They don't necessarily trust their people. And it's, it's, it's nice to see an organization where, the people are trusted. They're encouraged to, you know, encouraged to thrive, take risks, look at things differently. And, and yeah, you know, we, nice. Craig, we we certainly do have a lot of talented people in in the company, but it's it's a tactical share that we also do know that there's tools, there's things we don't know, there's tools that we can lean on and and call upon to help us. And so, you know, we've we've done that as well, external, like you know, by bringing in uh, people who are. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, executive coaches and um, and cultural uh, changing companies and and even uh, professional speakers to to provide some uh, helpful tools for you know our teams to understand how to how to work better together and how to manage more effectively. So there are some tactical things in there that that we've definitely had to do that have you know, like to Chris's point, channeled that vision. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it, it requires that, that continuous look and searching for, can we do this better? Do we have the right things internally to do it? Or do we need to, do we need to look outside ourselves? And so looking outside ourselves is the point that we, we do that quite a bit. There you go. I love what you guys are doing there. It's it's a great, it's a great story. How do you see the, and let's change gears. How do you see the market? I mean, obviously not a, a lot of big jets coming out, new big jets coming, um, is the industry going towards bigger, farther, bigger and farther, or the the light jet's going to stay in? Uh, how do you see the industry moving forward? What's uh, what's got you excited? What's got you scratching your head a little bit? Well, you, you had mentioned that you know there's uh, you know a couple of companies in the space going public. I think it's worthy of mentioning the fact that you, if you look at their customer base, um, they're, they're unique. They're different, and you know from from what we're doing. Uh, with with asset management and and supporting a lot of uh, international uh, aircraft that you know can fly all around the world and typically are you know super mid or larger um, that just happens to be kind of our specialty. Um, um, but you know with those companies that are that are going public, I mean they they provide a service to somebody wants access to a, a, a shorter amount or a smaller amount of uh, business aviation or private aviation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, for what we're seeing as is that whole um, atmosphere and the environment of business jet and private jet users is that there are more people in that space today than there ever were. Each segment is bigger. Um, and in our way, um, you know, we're focusing on, again, where we know best uh, and it's it's great to see these other companies uh, grow quickly because their innovations and their technologies and their stories, including the people that they create, mm-hmm. um, are helping build the industry. So the way that we see it from our vantage point, we see all these other companies doing these SPACs and these great things, like good for them. Uh, we're, we're happy to be disciplined to not want to do that as well as what we're doing. 
Right. Uh, but what they're doing is good for the industry in one way or another. And, um, and you know, we hope everyone does well with those, uh, you know, endeavors. Um, but we are certainly um, aware of what we are good at and staying with them. There you go. Chris, how do you see Oxford? You know, is 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 Oxford going to serve mostly? You know, obviously Teterboro's crowded, Morristown, White Plains. Do you see a lot of people, you know, using you know putting their airplanes out in Oxford and using them as gateway into the city, or is it? Yeah, you know, talk about the dynamic up there in the Northeast and what's happening with uh, you know business aviation. So yeah, so you know Oxford. Um, I have a a, a very biased viewpoint. I grew up basically wandering this airport uh, with my dad when there were no fences or a tower or anything else. And the place was littered with uh, GA aircraft on, on any piece of grass that was here in the in, in the midways between all the runways. There had to be, there must have been 350 tie downs at one point and, and every one of them was littered with, with an airplane. And then um, uh, a couple of local corporations uh, built some jet worthy hangars and and thus was born um, key air which which en ended up becoming a, a charter managed company now they had an own fleet model um, and and I won't go into all that and, and our thoughts on on that in mm -hmm. relation to how it fits with us because it's, it's not really relevant but but the point is is Oxford um, you know based on on Connecticut sales tax structure became um, Really, if you look at the at the tri-state area um, in the area of uh, 60 miles uh, circumnavigating around New York City, um, Oxford became, without a doubt, uh, the most populated and most active. Um, and, and frankly, the FAA uh, literally deems it a, a, a high operation airport and a national um, resource because of the number of business jets here. And, and, and I'll take a wag. I think it's somewhere... Right now, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of between 58 and 62 business jets are based here. And 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 in short, it's a bedroom community for business jets. Now, do we have a couple owners that that are that opt that, that leave from here uh, live? We do. Um, they're actually uh, we've had we've had them in the past come and go. Um, but primarily uh, this uh, Oxford offers a, a really high value proposition. So when you look at rates uh, for hangar. Um, and actually, let me just back up. There is no space at at Westchester or Teterboro for mm -hmm. for for any uh, business jets. Now, there's a, there's all sorts of different airports that are offering or trying to get into the to the reliever market, um, but Oxford remains um, probably the 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 most perfectly located um, uh, property that, to service that New York area. And, and there's a number of reasons why. One is we're very lucky that we have a tremendous the, the, the bulk of the um of the the business jet talent pool lives within 15 to 20 minutes of the oxford airport and and those folks have you know myself i, I worked out of westchester at one point um but um you know so they people commute to teterboro um but ultimately uh we're able to we, we have the talent pool close by we have rates that are um, land use rates and uh, a, a relationship with the state of Connecticut and the CAA, which actually owns the airport, mm -hmm. that is extremely amicable to the operation of business jets. Uh, we've got amazing tax structure. There's no sales tax on them here. Um, and then uh, uh, we have we have space, and and the space up here comes at a rate that uh, that's quite a bit lower um, in magnitude. If you go from Teterboro to Westchester to Oxford, there's a very meaningful uh, um, uh, decrease in 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 the costs of of operating these jets out of these facilities. And um, we've also enjoyed the fact that that out of Oxford, we've always had the luxury of having space where if you wanted to do maintenance on the aircraft, and, and we did open a 145 repair station specifically for that about six years ago, um, but we have the space to actually work on these business jets, which which allows us to um, give our owners, again, just a huge value um, yeah. because we're able to save on positioning, we're able to save on on uh, just on the, the hourly rates and the um, logistics costs of, of working, uh, doing maintenance on these business jets um, at the Oxford airport where, where you can jack a jet for a week and a half or, or three months if you have to and, and do a heavy inspection or whatever. Um, uh, but they, you know, the, the airplanes are, um, the, the value proposition of operating them out of here just far exceeds um, uh, 
by like, you know, to a large factor than operating out of the other locations. So um, so it just continues to grow. And, and, and frankly, you know, what was the problem here? The problem was capacity. Um, there, there was no capacity mm-hmm. uh, and, and capacity has done. Uh, so we decided, hey, let's go ahead and offer capacity and expand and thereby add more aircraft to the airport, um, which is great for the state. It's great for jobs. You know, there's mm-hmm. there's some. Just just in in uh, in that hangar alone, there's there's 200 direct jobs that are associated with that hangar, which is great for our state, um, and and they're great jobs. They're 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 fantastic. They're high paying jobs, um, and there's you know 400 construction jobs thereabouts um, that are associated with uh, the building of that hangar and and all the the earthwork that was associated with it. So. Yeah. Um, that that's a huge that's a huge boost to the state, and and, and it's good for everybody. So and, yeah. it's, and you know, and, and the vendors involved, and it just goes on and on and on. But it cascades out into the community. It's a it's a force multiplier in employment in the state of Connecticut. It's the one thing business aviation. I, I have to keep reminding people: business aviation is a huge contributor, provides a huge contribution. Yeah. Across yeah, I was country. I was at a uh, I was at a meeting with the uh, with the governor uh, a bunch of years ago, and, um, and and we talked and contemplated the fact that you know one business jet, um, you know, a G six fifty comes here. I, I have I have one on the airport now that I think it you know it employs somewhere in the neighborhood of twelve people um, directly, and 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 when you take all of their families, that that airplane's supporting you know like. 36 to 40 people. I mean, it, it's really right. impressive what one jet and, and people don't people don't get that. They don't understand that yeah. there, there's so many livelihoods associated with getting that airplane. Then you add vendors and you add all these other pieces to it. And it's um, again, you know, it all boils down to people. And and these jets have a profound effect in our state on, on the quality of life of the people. Absolutely. And Joe and Scott. So out west, you got Orange County now. You got John Wayne. And now you got a big investment made in Van Nuys. How does that help in your West Coast infrastructure? Well, you know, Craig, you talk about trends in the industry, and I, I see kind of three big movers. One is what I call upgaging of aircraft. The aircraft are getting larger. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even you take the Challenger 300 to the Challenger 350, right? By canting the winglets out, it grew by four feet in length. Right. You multiply that by the number of planes. These planes are just getting bigger even if it's just aerodynamic changes like the configuration of winglets and that's causing a greater need for more hangers and larger hangers uh the delivery forecasts call for 17 percent more business jets in the next 10 years than were delivered in the last 10 years and those next airplane being delivered are going to be bigger so they're going to have to go somewhere so that's the up gauging trend I think the second one is you have tremendous growth coming on, on, on the entry level to uh, expanding business aviation into eVTOLs. Um, over the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see six to 10,000 eVTOLs enter the marketplace. And that will usher in an entire new, not only generation of people, but more people into business aviation. And then the third one that we can't lose sight of is sustainability. The, and the the industry is really coalescing around a number of initiatives related to SAF and other alternative fuels, mm-hmm. but also just more efficient flight planning, uh, avoidance of contrails, things along those lines. There's so much the industry has done and is planning to do uh, that we got to keep an eye on that um, to, in order to drive sustainable growth. We know the growth is coming, but let's do it in a sustainable way. So those are the big three trends that I'm seeing that will grow the industry, both by size, but also the number of people accessing it. Yeah. Joe? You know, so from our our footprint, um, you know, a lot of our origin being out of uh, Southern California, you know, there, there's definitely a population density uh, still there. And so, you know, in terms of, you know, Scott's, um, you know, and the leadership team's uh, endurance and, and, and hard work at, at developing a space there where we can kind of have some overflow from our, our headquarters. Um, really, you know, Santa Ana is just, just a wonderful spot for us to, to be um, developing in. And so, you know, we do have a number of customers down there, but uh, being that it's, it is definitely a Mecca, um, they're they're in desperate need of of that hangar space, um, and so again, instilling those four business lines into Santa Ana 
and continuing to expand what we have in our Van Nuys footprint uh, will continue to be an initiative we focus on. Uh, but from what the from what the future holds for um, you know our company and, and growth of of our fleet and our our facilities, I mean we'll just be honest, it's opportunistic, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's not a private equity um, set up behind our ownership structure. So we have to be thoughtful and, and, and pretty conservative about how we grow. It has to be done in a, in a, a long-term view with uh, discipline. And so uh, that's, that's the way we look at all, any of our new uh, developments, investments. And it's important for us to make sure that, you know, uh, we're just not making bad business decisions. And so that's, that's among leaderships and man leaders and managers here at Clay Lisa, did you? I love it. Hey, we've been on this about an hour. Will you guys all come back? Absolutely. Let's uh, let's wrap For it sure. up here and uh, yeah. let's have another conversation in a few months. How's that sound? Yeah, sounds love good. I love, what you guys, I love what you guys are doing out there. It's been fun. Uh, it, it's been fun to watch Clay Lacey grow. Congratulations on all the success. And thanks for coming on. Wish you guys the best uh, holidays and happy new year. I hope you enjoyed the latest edition of the Aerospace Executive Podcast. You can reach out to me directly, Craig at NorthStarESG.com, or check us out at www.NorthStarESG.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Just do a search for Aerospace Executive Podcast. Thanks again. I'm Craig Pippen.